Uh, hey, Lindsay. Jay? I feel like it's the day of the week where we go live. Co is. Correct me if I'm wrong. Is this true? Tuesday. It's Tuesday. Welcome it's Tuesday. to Taylor Prime Time. Come on, the intro is strong, right? <laughs> it's not a useless clip. That the intro is strong, but you know what's stronger? Andy, take it away. What time is it? What time is it? It's prime time. It's prime time. What time is it? What time is it? Prime time. It's prime time. It's another Tuesday night. Hey, we're really happy tonight to have with us Director of Sales, Mr. Dave Pelletier. Hi, Dave. Welcome. Your set looks awesome, man. I think you spent a lot of time making it look groovy. As always, say hello to Lindsay Love. Hi, Lindsay. Hey, hey. What's happening? And your host in the corner, Mr. Jay Barkin on Prime Time. Oh, yeah. Every week, that was great. So did you wow. did you did you rehearse in the mirror today? <laughs> uh, yeah, yes, I did. I even cleaned the mirror first. <laughs> And then I rehearsed in it. <laughs> That's good. Helpful. I'm glad That's that you clean well. the mirror. Welcome to Taylor Primetime. Man, oh man, this week is good. Finding your guitar shop. And there is no one better to bring on the show than Mr. Dave Pelletier, director of sales at Taylor Guitars. He's got a storied career. That's true. In music <laughs> retail, music instruments, industry he's got a story career he's a father a husband a guitarist uh there's more but you'll learn that in a minute dave welcome to the show man you guys this i'm so honored you know i i so appreciate what you guys do here andy before we got rolling live i was i was complimenting andy on that that opening jingle the first time he played it that thing burrowed itself so deep into my mind and, and that that song pops into my head at the most inopportune times. But uh, no, thanks you guys. It's it's uh, what what an illustrious list of uh, folks who have preceded me, my esteemed colleagues and artists. And uh, man, thanks for having me. Man, oh man, we've been trying to get Dave for a while. We, you know, Dave's got a busy schedule, so you know, you, he's the kind of guy you got to get months in advance. And he shoots you a couple of dates, and we figure out the dates, and this one worked out perfectly. And what an exciting show. This is going to be awesome. But Dave, you know, you know, this show has some segments, right? And Indeed. there is a segment that we like to just do. We just start off quick. And that is a, it's a segment we call hug your haters. And you know what we have first before Andy plays a song, Dave, we have a useless clip. I feel better already. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Andy, take it away. Everybody needs a hug these days. Maybe now more than ever. Remember to keep most hugs only in your mind maybe later this year we can hung anyone anytime yes it's true we use bolts 
In our neck design, it's a guarantee your action can always be low and divine. We don't hate no on the dovetail. It works just fine with empty comes years of peace of mind. Wow. I love it, Andy. I love it. Okay. Oh, mom. Hi, mom. My mom's watching. She just sent me a text. She's here with us. Uh, mom, this next one is very inside baseball, but follow along, okay? So everyone, <laughs> we've been trying to engage every time, you know, I manage social, oversee social at Taylor, and we, we try and, you know, we want people to engage, just like the show. You guys are, you know, deep in the comments right now, chatting with us. You join this show every single week. This is, we like to hang out with you as much as, you are nice enough to <laughs> grace us with your presence and hang out with us on Tuesdays. Hug your haters. So this week, as you know, sometimes we call this day Tuesday. Sometimes we call it Taylor Tuesday. So we'll do Taylor Tuesday posts. We have a series of content that we make that's called Taylor Stories. We've done a few of them. We did one with Linda Perry, with the great Steve Poltz. They're great. They're really fun everyone's got a Taylor story. So I posted this on all the socials, but we'll go to Twitter real quick. Taylor stories. Everybody has one. What's yours? We'd love to hear it in the comments below. Hashtag Taylor Tuesday. Well, the very first comment that we got was no bolt on necks for acoustics. End of story. <laughs> <laughs> Well, my reply to him was, but have you played one? And that's it. Hey, hopefully he plays one. We hear you loud and clear. You don't like bolt-on necks. We love dovetail too, but bolt-ons, they work. Yep. Man, our guitars are just so consistent. And they're easily set up. I don't have to sell it anymore. Anyway, that was a good, good, good hug your haters. I love it. I love it. The next segment, Dave, what are you listening to? I do have a useless clip. All right. What am I listening to? Wait, I think I just got a song, Dave. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Okay. Go for it, Andy. Did you waltz or do math? Did you find a new path? Old country or swing? Did you stand up and sing? What's new? What's new? What are you listening to? What did you listen to? What don't you have a theme song for, Andy? You are just this font of creativity. I'm, I'm jealous. I want lessons on, on chord structure and songwriting. That okay, that's it. You owe me now, buddy. Okay. <laughs> Andy's songs are so good. Mm -hmm. Hey, we got hate in the feed. It's okay. They're useless what? clips. We need to talk. We need to show useless clips sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> proves that we increased the budget by a hundred dollars for this show. That's, That's it. Jay, we also got two haters now in the last two weeks, which is good because we went two weeks without any hate. I know. It's just a little weird for these times. I mean, right? I mean, you can't expect that. No, we need hate. So just bring it on. Next week will be good. Dave, what are you listening to? All right. A couple things. My my musical tastes run all over the place. And uh, I'm, I'm a classic rock guy originally, but I've branched out into many other things. But right now, if I had to pin it down, uh, it would be some Radiohead, which I'm a big fan. I think Andy's aware of that. And, uh, and then to, to completely flip it in the other direction, uh, some Tony Rice. Mm. Uh, my, I mean, gosh, that guy, Church Street Blues, that record in particular 
if you're an aspiring flat picker, oh my gosh, it's it's kind of it's interesting. You know, we we lost Eddie Van Halen last year in October, and we lost Tony Rice just a couple months back. And both of those guys, huge influences, and they both shredded in their own world. You know, Tony Rice was the Eddie Van Halen of of flat picking, if you will, and uh, huge influence. I just was listening to some of that, and and I mean, I don't know if you've ever tried to play fiddle tunes, just flat picking. You know, I've got this five seventeen behind me here. It's the perfect guitar for that. And trying to play Tony Rice songs is like trying to play Eddie Van Halen songs. It's just as imposing and intimidating and wonderful. And uh, that's it, man. Cattle in the cane. Sounds sounds kind of silly, but just that that tune alone right there is enough to keep me busy for six months just trying to figure it out. <laughs> and so, hey, Tony Rice, oh man, we yeah, it's it's wild. It, it's it's a little, it's scary. That's what it is. It's a little terrifying, but yep. it's impressive. And you're right. He's like Eddie Van Halen. Um, before we go on to Lindsay, what's your favorite Radiohead record? Man, it's that's that's a deep conversation. You know, it was OK Computer got me into them, and, okay. and probably my favorite Radiohead tune is on that record. But I've grown into into other records of theirs. Uh, In Limbo is great. Hail to the Thief, Kid A, Amnesiac. I mean, you name it. There's there are great moments on every one of their records that that it's it's not like a sugar cube that melts on your tongue and it's gone. It's like it's it's substance that you can listen to. And it goes deep. And I, that's what I appreciate about their stuff. Yeah. I'm, I'm right there with you. I'm all over yeah. the place. Some days I like more than others. Yeah. Yeah. It, each one's uh, an acquired taste, you know, and it's just what you're feeling that day. Absolutely. Lindsay, what are you to blame for this week? Because now <laughs> I'm stuck listening to, okay. What are you listening to? Uh, well, so two things. One, because of our conversation with Carrie last week. And I forgot that he had played with Lettucey a bunch, who's an R&B artist, soul artist. So I, I went and listened to her album, which she just won, I think, R&B, traditional R&B record of the year for the Grammys. Um, it was like Anything For You, I think that's what it was. But it's called her album's The Wild Card. So good. Lettucey. And then um, John Batista's album, We Are. He just he dropped one this year. And he's so good. He's so a phenomenal. Good. Yeah, he's so good. So good. So. Ah, so good. Yeah. Andy. I love the uh, day's comparison between Tony or, uh, and, and Eddie because, they, yeah, they both influenced tens of thousands of, of guitar players, you know, uh, in, in different directions and in, in sort of a similar, like, mind-blowing, shredding uh, way that nobody had ever heard before. Um, we, I mentioned this before, we do this uh, thing with our sales team where we put together uh, playlists uh, on Fridays. And uh, I was reminded of a, an old favorite record of mine, uh, Graceland by Paul Simon, mm -hmm. uh, that I went back to revisit. And uh, it still held, holds the same magic for me after, uh, after all these years. Um, Desert Island album, for sure. You know, just a, a great, a great, you've got the, the songwriting melody chord structure of paul simon infused with with the african um, uh, musicians who played on that record south african musicians and it's just uh, a, a stew uh, a musical stew that is uh always always smells good tastes great <laughs> <laughs> uh judith oh you got you did it huh my goodness man All right and then, then I started going back, Judith Hill. I started going back and back and back and just scouring it up and down in every which way and finding different versions and renditions and live and YouTube. And I, I just, you were absolutely spot on there, Lindsay. Oh, man. Watch out. Yeah. That is, who? I'm a little bit. Yeah. So. When I, I did take a break, though, uh, a Iron Maiden break. I have mm -hmm. to do Iron Maiden at least once or twice a week. So I did take an Iron Maiden break this week. But Judith Hill, man. Wow. Did you listen to Sublime? Absolutely not. <laughs> Don't get me started. <laughs> There's a couple of bands that I dislike. There are two bands that I dislike. I'll, I'll I'll say it right now: Sublime and The Doors. 
Uh, And you can hate me all you want. I cannot with those bands. Now, if Jim Morrison just did spoken word, I would be there every single day. But it was the music. I don't know. I couldn't do it. Anyway, that's me. (laughs) Right on. It's okay. It's okay. Anyway. All right. We're let's dive into the show so that we can get going. 15 minutes of guitar nerd talk. We talk too much sometimes, Dave, but some folks forget when they first come here, they don't realize this is a guitar nerd talk show. So that's what we're going to do. We're just, we're lucky to have Andy who knows how to actually play instruments. Yeah. I'm just kidding. Andy, (laughs) we love you. Thank you for bringing the music every single week. Dave Pelletier, Director of Sales, Taylor Guitars. We're talking about finding your guitar shop, that place that you go and that you can trust. Um, But before we get there, let's get to know you. Dave Pelletier, you know the question that's coming next. What in the heck do you do? (laughs) Well, you know what? Thankfully, at at Taylor, we, we think really like entrepreneurs. I mean, we're all owners now, right? I'm wearing my employee owned shirt here. You can't see it all, but it's the first time I've worn it because I had nowhere else to go to wear it. But uh, we all just roll up our sleeves and get it done. I'm on the sales team. Uh, think about it. We're all, all of us at Taylor, we're in the inspiration business, right? Uh, you, you could argue that you need a guitar to live, but you probably need food and water and shelter and those kind of things. But uh, we want guitars. And so we want to inspire the world to make music and uh, we especially love it when they use our guitars to do that so on the sales team we're working with with great dealers we're, we're uh, exciting and inspiring them to include our brand in in their success and uh, having a fun time doing it so i work with an amazing team including yourselves by the way and uh, we learn from each other with great team you know andy referenced the the get together where we talk about musical influences that's something that happened since the pandemic, every other Friday, we talk about that. And it's kind of a team bonding thing. Last thing of the day on Friday, talking about our musical influences. And in those sessions, we all realize why we're in this wacky business. You know, it's it's about the music. It's about participating in music. It's about playing guitar as, as uh, uh, you know, a, a way to do that, to be involved in music. So anyway, that's what we we do. I work with an amazing team of, of guys and, and, and gals who um, I'm humbled by, and we just, like I say, we're in the inspiration business, and uh, very happy to do what I do and where I do it. Yeah, and, you know, I've been here for, it'll be five years in April, and um, you were one of the first people that I connected with, Dave, and uh, it was when, before you were a director, and we'll we'll get into that in in a second, but I would come over and kind of do the walk-by knock, you got a minute and just lean into you, just learn from you and, and, and be inspired by your knowledge and your, your wealth of information about this industry. It's really great. Um, but guitar, before we get into the industry side of things, when was the first time that you found guitar that it, you were like, this is my instrument? Man, it's funny. It, it goes back to San Diego. Uh, I was a little kid, probably six, seven years old, and I had this little transistor radio. It was just an AM radio, and songs like, oh, man, this is going back. Uh, the Bay City Rollers, come on. What was that song? S-A-T-U-R-D-A-Y. Was that them? Saturday night, yeah. Saturday, Saturday night. night. So they would come on, and that song kind of caught my eye, and, and uh, The Night Chicago Died. You know, that kind of stuff was playing. I mean, stuff that we look back at is kind of schmaltzy. Terrible. Terrible kind of, kind of. And, uh, but that was starting to catch my ear. So pop music. But then the song that did it for me was Elton John's Saturday Night's All Right for Fighting. That riff, as a seven-year-old kid, I went, what is that? I must know. So I got in trouble. I was supposed to turn off that radio when I went to bed at night. But I had to keep listening to the whatever the, the AM station was to see if that song would come back on. And my mom would peek in the door and say, hey, turn that radio off. So I found out if I put the radio under my pillow, it actually made it sound better because it filtered all the, the crummy frequencies on the AM radio. But when that song came on, and that kind of drove it until I got into uh, early high school when I spent my entire summer earnings on my first electric guitar and amp and every last penny. 
What was it? It was a, a fantastic guitar. It was an Ibanez artist, you know, carved top, double cutaway. And I mean, great guitar. I wish I had it back. It was, it was a really good instrument. And the brand of the amp was acoustic. Amp, not so good. And, uh, <laughs> and it's been uh, just as all of us, you know, it's just you're horse trading, you're buying new stuff, you're trading stuff in, and you're accumulating stuff over the years. And it's just a lifelong pursuit. And, uh, but that's, that's where it started. It was hearing the, the guitar prominently in a, in a song, a riff, a riff based t tune and just going, oh, I, I have to figure out what that is and, and emulate it. And it's been you know, a lot of years since still trying to emulate it. That's great. Lindsay, do you remember your first guitar? I do. Yep. Um, well, the first one I bought with my own money, cause I had a classical one. My dad gave me, he had guitars in the house, but the first one I bought was a Kima electric. Like what is, a, what is a Kima? I don't even know what that is anymore, but <laughs> It was like a hundred bucks and I paid for it. And yeah. <laughs> but that, that moment of pride, Andy, do you remember your first guitar? The Cortez Les Paul Jr. It was, I think it was probably made in Japan at the time. And I remember going to the shop with my mom it was in a house. It was an old Victorian house that was turned into a guitar shop and I had saved money as well. Like Dave said, but I didn't have enough for, this is a great story to set up the local mom and pop <laughs> because I didn't have enough money to pay for it. And I looked down and I was like, oh, and he wrote down the balance. He's like, well, you know, the, you still owe me $37 and 84 cents. And he looked at me and he said, how long will it take you to pay that off? You know, he said that to me and I was a kid. I'd never, nobody had ever asked me that before. I said, uh, I, maybe, maybe a year, maybe a year or so. And he goes, Okay. <laughs> <laughs> And I still have the receipt somewhere in my stuff. And it's it's like from the guy, handwritten, Cortez Jr., Les Paul, serial number, balance to be paid within 12 months. And I was just like, you know, of course. <laughs> awesome. And I was like, all right. I went home and I had it. I didn't have an amp yet, but I had an electric guitar. So <laughs> I, I remember my first. My first was that cream-colored um, Squire, Fender Squire Strat, right? And I, I went, it, Paul Tobias is in the feed. He'll, he'll, he'll remember this maybe. Naperville, Illinois. You might remember it too, Andy. Naperville, Illinois. I believe the, the mall in Naperville, Illinois is called Fox Valley Center. And they had a music store in Fox Valley Center. And it was like the worst music store ever. But they had, you know, like a sprinkling of instruments up on there. And I wanted to play bass. I really wanted to play bass, probably because I wasn't that good at math and I could only count to four. But my mom, my mom said to me, no, you know, she was a pianist and she sang in the church choir and that she knew what she was talking about. <laughs> I didn't. And, and I was a saxophone player at the time. And she's like, no, maybe you should learn how to play six strings first. And so that was the guitar I bought. I was terrible. At first, it was only until years later when I picked it up again and figured it out. But everybody's got that first guitar. I love it. And that first music store. That's for certain. So a couple of more questions, Dave, and then we'll get into the meat of, of the subject. But who is your biggest musical influence in your life? Man, it's it's all over the place. You know, I, I referenced uh, Mr. Van Halen. So er, early on, once I really started to pick up the guitar that was it. But you know what, I, man, every, every guitar player I watch has something to teach me. You know, when, when Andy played the opening tune for the first time, I go, what are those chords? Okay. It looks like seventh to a major seven. Okay, cool. All right. And what I do, I picked up my guitar and started strumming it. So I, you know, from a kid playing in his garage, you know, it's like, man, you know what? The kid's getting some kind of tone. It's actually really cool. I wonder what he's doing. So I'm, Maybe I'm just easily influenced, who knows? But I, I try to be a student of the instrument. Uh, what I love about this is you, you never stop growing and learning with it, you know? It's, it's, I suppose you could say that about a few things, you know, golf is one of those things, you, you never really master it, uh, yeah. but, but the guitar is that way. So yeah, influence comes, I mean, all the classic stuff, you know, it was Jimmy Page, it was Alex Lifeson. And then as my musical tastes, matured and expanded, you know, I'm still trying to keep an open mind to new music, you know, and discovering new stuff. And, um, and even 
taking non-guitar based music and, and, and making it ready for guitar, you know? So there's, there's just, it's an endless world, but yeah, inspiration comes from all kinds of stuff. And, uh, but early, the early rock superheroes is really what got me started. Absolutely. Um, so then let's pivot. What got you into music retail? What got you into the manufacturing side of, of music? Walk us through that journey of life. So it's interesting. I, you know, I shared the story of my, my first guitar purchase and thankfully the uh, art of musical instrument retail has evolved since then, you know, back, back at that time, I don't know if anyone can relate. It was kind of like young kid walking into the store, pointing at the wall going, Hey, how much is that guitar? And the response is, well, how much you got kid? <laughs> and, uh, we, thankfully we've come a long way since then, but, um, so my love for music, love for guitar, uh, love to be involved in music. Uh, shopped at retail stores in in the Los Angeles area, and then got this this paper catalog, a musician's friend catalog, and I was buying just accessories and stuff through the mail. It was kind of adventurous at the time. Internet didn't exist. I'm dating myself here, but uh, so I'm fast forward. I moved to Oregon with my family to take a job. It was just my wife at the time, actually. And uh, took a job there for a few years. And then I found out that this musician's friend company was actually headquartered about 20 miles down the road from me in Medford, Oregon. So I was in Southern Oregon and I was shopping at the store there and, and hanging out. And uh, I was kind of ready to make a, a career change and, and uh, just ready for something new and different. I was young. I could, I could make an abrupt pivot. Right. And, uh, took a job as a store manager of the original number one musician's friend store in Medford, Oregon. And the company was based there. So it was cool. I had a lot of support from uh, on the corporate side and uh, it was immersion, you know, just trial by fire. I, I'd managed a team before, but I hadn't managed a retail store before. And you know what? I'll tell you a secret. Retail is hard <laughs> and, uh, and it's great. And I am so glad I did it. But my heart goes out to anybody who's working any retail gig, not just in, in the musical instrument business or we call the MI business. But um, if you've never worked food service or retail, you haven't lived yet. And uh, everybody <laughs> should do a tour of duty in either of those industries so you know what it's like on the other side. And, uh, you know, think about uh, the holidays when when we're home with our families, there are people working retail, you know, working the long hours. And anyway, so I got involved in, on the retail side. And love that. And then Musician's Friend, if anyone's familiar with our story, um, we were acquired by Guitar Center. I'm sure everyone's familiar with Guitar Center. Um, and so I went from being a Musician's Friend manager to a Guitar Center manager. And uh, we went from being a very small company to a really big company. And uh, it was a, it was a, we, we grew up, uh, our retail operation grew up overnight and uh, it was exciting. And then I really enjoyed the Musician's Friend culture and this, this internet thing was just starting starting off and and you know there was this thinking that the, the internet could be used for customers to place orders wouldn't that be convenient that's pretty cool so uh, I, I made the move from retail into the corporate office and i was on the inventory side of the business that's boring i don't want to bore you with that story but what was cool is three guys in a in a dark room drinking nothing but mountain dew built a website that turned out to be a really beautiful thing so we had this this catalog the catalog i used to shop from in la Right. I was now involved with and uh, as my career uh, evolved with with Musician's Friend, I ended up running the guitar category for a number of years and just an amazing, amazing thing. And, and I don't know if you guys, it's you, you sit back, you go, man, the, the guitar has taken me some incredible places and, and allowed me to meet some incredible people. And it's such a privilege. But uh, anyway, uh, Guitar Center, Musician's Friend for a total of uh, 16 years and um, then uh, when Guitar Center uh, uh, combined Musician's, musician's Friend, uh, I, I took time to leave. I, I made the choice to, to leave the company after 16 years, very tough to do, and uh, went to Gibson Guitars and uh, ran North America sales for a, a period of time and then uh, left to go to Breed Love Guitars to, to uh, be the general manager there and, and help get things turned around at the time there and great experience, great people there. And then uh, did some consulting in the industry. And then Keith Brawley, 
our chief business development officer called me up one day and he said, well, don't you want a real job? You know, come down and talk to us. <laughs> and uh, I, I actually have been doing business with Taylor for years. I brought Taylor into the Musician's Friend assortment. So I've been working with the team at Taylor for a long time. And then uh, now I'm on the team and it's been five years. Uh, so Jay, just a little bit longer than you. It was five years last November and the time has gone by amazingly fast. And I can't believe I've worked from home for the past year and uh, looking forward to seeing you guys in, in person in the, in the hopefully not too distant future. But uh, yeah, incredible story. I'm incredibly privileged. I've gotten to travel all over the world just for this silly guitar. And uh, I couldn't be happier than, than to be here and uh, feel like I found an incredible home, a company whose values I share. And uh, yeah, just what an honor. And you're an owner. <laughs> That's right. We all are. <laughs> How crazy is that? I know. Who would have thunk that? Did you think that was going to happen? Nope. No way. None no of way. It did. Um, all right. So let's segue just a little bit into tonight's topic. We want to help people. You probably, most of you know all of this stuff in the feed, but remember other people watch these videos, these live streams after the fact. And so really trying to give that information and get some really gain some insight from both Dave, Andy, who's on our sales team, Lindsay, who's been buying guitars since she was since her dad punished her and made her learn how to play guitar. <laughs> and from me, right? I purchased guitars way back at Fox Valley Mall in Naperville, Illinois. So really wanting to dive into that. But Dave, I want to talk about large stores, big box retail, online retail, and mom and pop stores. That's what I want to dive into. I think that we need to run the gamut here. So before we get started, everyone in the feed, we have a very, 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 I'm saying a lot of varies, special three-minute piece of content that my good friend Gabriel made for our good friend, Paul Tobias. You guys ready for this? All right. Three minutes. We'll see you back in three minutes. When I was a kid, this was a barber shop. Oh, wow. And I got my first, very very first official haircut in this room. If we pulled up this carpet, you'll still see the ring in the tile floor underneath. And who would have thought all those years later that we'd been, be hanging out in the Taylor showroom? Chicago, home of the World Series champion Cubs, the Blues, deep dish pizza, and that weird bean thing. 20 miles west is the sleepy little suburb of Downers Grove. It's the kind of place where a mom-and-pop neighborhood music store can still thrive. And that's what brings me here, to visit my friend Paul at Tobias Music, a true mom-and-pop shop that's consistently been a top-tier Taylor dealer and has been selling Taylors for over 35 years. So probably 30-ish years just in this room. I wonder if, um, some of the older plaques are hanging on the wall. You can see the newer ones up on top for... You know, the awards for Taylor Guitars, top 10 dealer, top 20 dealer, All number of one dealer in Illinois. And I still freak out that I see what a lot of work it's to do with this kind of space and all that to, to run the business. And how the heck were my parents a, a, a top 20 Taylor dealer out of this little space? So it's amazing. Hats off to them. But my parents met Bob and Kurt at a guitar show. Summer NAMM shows used to be in Chicago. And they met Bob and Kurt at a damn show with their Taylor guitar booth. And my mom was apparently talking about it and just really enjoyed the visit. And as the story goes, my mom called my dad over and said, you know, you really need to give these guys a shot at the store. And my dad will fully admit that his response was, we're a Martin dealer. We don't, we don't need another line of acoustics. And my mom's response to that was that Bob and Kurt are such nice guys, we should give them a chance. So she made, she gets credit for that executive decision <laughs> of bringing Taylor guitars in here and look what that's on to now. They specialize in high-end custom guitars, a great selection of scotch, and the kind of old-school customer service shops like Tobias Music pride themselves on. First and foremost, I'm trying to sell the vibe here. Sure. That sense of community, cool hangout, come sit down, watch the Cubs game, maybe have a scotch or a uh, I want to hang out with our customers, get to know their life, their playing style a little bit, and then we can maybe fit them in to sure. something. I mean, Taylor's really good. They have it on their sign here, find your fit. Uh, this concept works well. Um, 
Yeah, we've definitely seen uh, an increase in foot traffic. Go on our website, go on our Facebook page. You see we're a mom and pop store. Yeah. If you log on to our website, the first thing you see is a picture of my mom and dad, my wife and I. Sure. And that's intentional. We are a mom and pop store. This is the way guitar shops used to be. Wow. Did Jay split or what? And then there were three. Dave, you know what I loved about that the most? I mean, outside of the Tobias family is always a fun, fun hang. And I've been able to do some work for them in the past. But he used the word community in that. And to me, that's what finding, that is such a big part of finding your music store. To me, that was huge in my life. There's yep. been a couple different times when I was, uh, when I was like I said, I bought that first guitar. It, back then, it, back in the day, that we did not have access to the information that we have now, right? I mean, I think, of course, right? You, it's, it's a long time ago. I remember the first time I went to the Sound Post in Mount Prospect, Illinois, and heard somebody playing Distortion. All right, this I sound like a caveman saying this, right? But <laughs> but my amp had my only had a, an amp that was a tube amp, but it was clean. It, it didn't have any gain on it, you know. And I was like, I had no idea what that was, and how how does Jimmy Page do that, and how, what's going on? And I remember walking into the room, and some guy just playing a first position D chord through an overdrive pedal, and I was like, whoa, what? I, and I remember like scooting past, like watching him. And, and so he was sitting down, and I just like, what? Is, oh, there's something on the floor. What's that thing that's flashing on the floor? You know, I mean, a, again, remedial information. And nowadays, I, I guess kids don't need to go through that. But the sense of learning that you can get um, from being in a in a guitar store like somebody like Paul or somebody who's been around forever, like they, you learn things. Like they can say, "Hey, have you ever heard listen to Tony Rice? You ever checked him out?" You know, those are, that's the place where you learn that kind of stuff. And I think that that can never be replaced um, by all the, the, the cool things that online does for you, the, the service, the guarantee. I mean, it's a science now, right? It's, it's a great way to buy things. However, that sort of thing, that person-to-person interaction, sense of community exists in mom-and-pop guitar stores. Totally agree. Totally agree. Yeah, man. The, the, the whole music discovery process for me happened at, at the store where I got my guitar. You know, I learned the, the, the riff to, to Lover Boys, Turn Me Loose, because the sales guy there was playing that song. It's like, wow. And then you're right, the distortion pedal. That was my first purchase after my guitar and amp. It was a Boss DS1, which was, you know, that was a amazing pedal back in the days it was still a great pedal for some i remember that lick, that, that tunes in g right oh, no. yeah. uh, oh, that's it that's yeah. the one <laughs> thank you for knowing that that riff yeah, yeah. Lindsay, where did where did what was the first memory you had of going to a guitar shop oh wow um I was young. I want to say it was when I bought my electric because my my mom and dad had instruments all over our house, so we didn't really go a ton. I went with my dad to go get things fixed, or he got a um, he had a lot of keyboards. But when I went to go buy my electric, it was the first time I actually paid attention myself. I actually still have the electric somewhere. I'm going to show it when I find it. It's somewhere <laughs> in the midst of all my guitars. But that's when I was kind of like, "Whoa, this is a really cool experience." And then just sitting down and playing, and everything you just said when you're able to sit down and the community you get with other players playing, you're testing out amps, you're talking, you're learning things from each other. Honestly, I got a couple of gigs from playing at, you know, at different, I mean, just so much happens when you're able to sit down with people and other musicians. And um, yeah, it's a, it's a, an experience. I actually really miss, I haven't been, I mean, I walked in, I think to a store a couple of weeks ago to get like a, an adapter, but I haven't actually sat in a store in a while. And I miss it. Me too. Me too. It was such a big it. part of growing up and, and and learning about like what you wanted to do and what you wanted to be and all the possibilities mm-hmm. of how to actually get 
sounds and and what people were were doing back then and and uh I have some, and I uh, eventually I ended up interning at a store when I was in college. I taught there, and it was the first time I kind of worked on a retail floor and you know answered the phone or took out the garbage or whatever they let me do. But uh, it was a huge part of of I think what I've learned and um, what got us, like Dave said, like what got us to this point. You know, absolutely. So Dave, I'm you know I. Technology is crazy, right? So we're just going to yeah. keep, keep rolling. But when yeah. when someone's going to a to a to to a local mom and pop shop or a guitar store, what is what is something that somebody should look you know look out for when they're looking for the right guitar shop? What are some things that that you look for when you're? Yeah, you know, it's it's a great question. When when Jay told me that this was the topic, it's 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 something. Man, think of how much great gear there is to choose from today. It's ridiculous. It's an embarrassment of riches. There's so much to choose from. It's amazing. So how do you drill down to, remember I said we're in the inspiration business, you know, well, retail is part of that, you know, online is part of that. It's all about inspiring us. So I think you have to ask some questions. Now I'm going to take off my Taylor guy hat and just put on my guitar guy looking for a great guitar hat, you know, which all of us are in that mode at all times, whether we need to be or not. We kind of have our radar up all the time. So where could we be best served? You know, really, that's a question we have to answer. You know, what what things are important to you about where you get your guitar? You know, I'll, I'll give you a, a silly story. When, when I was first married, my wife, Shannon, um, I'd say, hey, let's go to the guitar store on Saturday. And just, I don't know, I don't want to get anything. I just want to check it out. And And her enthusiasm each time went like this, you know. And one day she said, Hey, you know how you feel when I take you to the fabric store? She said, that's how I feel going to the guitar store. And <laughs> that was an epiphany for me. It's like, okay, I don't like the fabric store. It's really boring. And I don't want to go there ever again. So anyway, um, <laughs> a lot of things to consider, you know, is it, is there, is it a place that you want to hang out? Right. Is, is it, man, I wrote a whole bunch of stuff down here. I, I hate to read, uh, read notes here, but um, think about a restaurant you really dig, right? And and you're a regular there. Well, why do you keep going back? You know, is it because you're recognized when you walk in? You know, it's like it's like uh, Norm from Cheers. You know, it's like no, everybody knows him. <laughs> and and so there's that kind of vibe, that kind of feeling. And if that's important to you to feel known, then then put that one aside, set that aside here. So we're going to talk about some kind of some virtues, if you will. And any kind of store can can operate with these virtues, whether it's a big store or a small store or anything. So um, think about the restaurant analogy. Um, ask yourself, are you transactional or are you relational? You know, do you want to just get in, get out? Do you want to haggle, get the best deal possible and then get out of there? Or do you want to sit and talk to someone who can impart knowledge on you? You know, for me, I, I love when someone is a much better player than me because I will listen to their expert advice. You know, that's a really cool thing. So if, if that's something that you want, I remember I took golf lessons one time and I, and the guy giving me lessons, I, I took my seven iron and I gave it to him and I said, can you show me what this club can do? And he said, yeah, no problem. And when he hit the ball, it's like, I got the right set of clubs because I had no idea my seven iron could do that. <laughs> right. Same way with a guitar. You know, when you put a guitar in the hands of someone who's not showing off, but just they can they have command of the instrument. They have an opinion that matters to you. You look up to them. So if that's important to you, set that aside. Right. Uh, so you got a couple of those things. What else? What makes you loyal? You know, what what kind of business wh what earns your loyalty? You know, think about what those things are. Are those things important to you or are you, again, a transactional? I want to get in, get a deal and get out. Because if that's the case, you're going to bounce around from shop to shop. But really, I would I would look at what is the ecosystem where you live, you know, within a reasonable radius to drive to. And then just kind of size up that ecosystem. And and finding a shop is easy, but finding the shop takes a little more, you know, even when I was a kid, when I was you know, 15, 16 years old, getting my first guitar, I, I drove around to all the shops, you know, and it was the one with the the biggest selection and, and I probably wasn't treated the best, but it was, it was impressive to me. And that was important to me at that time. So it's really asking yourself, what's important to you? What kind of environment do you enjoy? Do you want to hang out there or do you feel like you might need a tetanus shot after you leave? You know, 
It, there's all kinds of stores out there, you know. Um, <laughs> where would you send a, a friend or or family member to this store? You know, I, I had to send my my son's wife, my daughter-in-law, uh, to get an amplifier for my son at Christmas time, and I didn't want to stress her out. You know, is there is there good parking? You know, is it in a good neighborhood? Uh, I, I don't want her to have a terrible impression of our industry because she had a, a bad experience picking up an amplifier for my son. Um, so think of those kind of things too. You know, we we have to appeal to the the broad uh, uh, swath of people who don't play guitar. You know, we want to be welcoming yeah. to those folks too. But um, and then I would say, talk to the sales staff, talk to the management, find out what makes them tick, and and show them some love. You know, a little kindness goes a long way. And, uh, and like I said, retail is hard. So, yeah. so, you know, a little graciousness is, is a great thing and, and find out, you know, what, uh, you know, where are they strong? So if you look at that ecosystem of dealers in your, in your radius, you know, kind of determine what are the superpowers of each one, you know, like looking at the Paul Tobias video, you know, I bet Paul could do scotch pairings with certain guitars. <laughs> and and that would be super cool, right? So that is clearly a superpower of of Paul's. But uh, every dealer has them. It's finding, you know, doing the discovery process, and and don't be afraid to talk to people. And another thing that's really important, though, is you know, there's nothing like demoing a guitar or a piece of gear that's in your hands. You can watch yeah. all the YouTube videos in the world, right? And there's so many of them, and they're great, and they're super helpful. But having a piece of gear in your hands and, or at your feet. There's no substitute for that. So can you can you get to a yes, Jay? Can, can you get to a demo room where you can really hear what you're playing? That's super important for me. For me, but so ask yourself: Are those things important to you? Anyway, Jay, welcome nice. back, buddy. Welcome back, Jay. So uh, you know we don't. Jay's kind of he's been lost here, so we don't really need Jay for a second or so. Is that is it okay, right. Lindsay? Is that right? I, I think that's about right. <laughs> so I was going to ask Dave, what kind of a, a buyer are you? Are you a transactional person like that? Or what, what do you, you, you laid out, you asked people to think about what they want. What are, where, where, where do you fall on that, on that scale? What do you, what do you look for? I, I like having an expert who I trust and I'll pay mm. more for that expertise. That to me is more valuable than, than a deal. You know, the right guitar is the right guitar period, you know, or the right piece of gear is the right piece of gear. And if I got someone who, who knows a lot about it and has that confidence in, in what they're recommending, and they're not just looking to close me, but they really care about my rig and they know about my tastes and they know, they know me, you know, that's, that's, there's a fancy term for that called uh, customer relationship management or customer mm. relations management, CRM. Forget about that. Do they know me? Do I have a guy? Same thing can work if you have a tailor, T-A-I-L-O-R. You know, who, who knows you, knows the kind of fabric you like and the kind of cut of suit you like. And I've never had a bespoke suit put together, but I, I'd love one. And if I had someone that kind of knew my tastes and, and that kind of thing, I would pay more for that to have it done right and feel good about my purchase because someone who really knew about it made that recommendation. Mm. What about you, Andy? Are, yeah. you are you transactional or? No, uh, not really. Uh, I think that the long term is more important, and I and I think also that when, like like we mentioned, if you if you are in food service, if you've worked a food service job, which I have, and I've worked retail, which I have, you appreciate those people and the work they do, and it sort of gives you a completely different mindset, right? So I was in retail for a long time, and I know what it's like to have somebody come into your store, and and you are the expert. You know, you're the expert. You've spent hours showing somebody your expertise, and then you see them two months later, and they're like, "Oh, well, I, you know, I saved sales tax by ordering from out of state." Ah, <laughs> that's like I still, after all these years, just burns me, man. You know, because you it, it you put your heart into it, and uh, it, it's like it's like you know going and playing a gig, and then having the manager say, "Yeah, but I can get a different band for fifty dollars less." Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Great. That's great, man. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I appreciate the expert. Um, I appreciate people who recognize you when you come in. They they call you later and they say, "Man, how, I just wanted to let you know how is or I wanted to know how that pedal is that you got. Are you using it? Yep. Or does it work for you? Because I know you weren't sure about. It. You know, like following that's, up. That's huge. 
Even yep. even if it's like you, you know, because normally that sort of follow up gets you talking about something else, right? Mm -hmm. Right. If, if if you say, yeah, it's cool, but I really was wondering about this. Oh, I got one of those, too. You know, like that continues the whole relationship. Right. Yep. And so um, I certainly remember those. How much money you got days, kid. I, I remember <laughs> those and and kind of being treated like like poop, you know, sometimes. But, uh, but I think things have changed over the years, you know, and mm -hmm. uh, I think everybody's a little bit more professional than they used to be. Yeah, much more respectable than it used to be. Wow, this is a great conversation. I watched it. I, I watched it the whole uh -huh. time, but apparently someone ran over the internet in my neighborhood. And, oh, no. And the internet service provider said to me, oh, we're sorry. Uh, Your internet's down. Don't you know you were on prime time, dude? I was doing a live show. <laughs> But it's oh. cool. They're holding it together, and I appreciate that. So <laughs> I'm just going to sit back and relax and let you guys continue. <laughs> the one who was the most bummed was my mom. She sent me a text and said, no, seriously, where are you? <laughs> <laughs> so, mom, I'm back. <laughs> we died. It's, it's all right. We're, we're back, and everything's cool. Uh, great way. conversation. Uh, keep going. Yeah, well, I think based on, you know, you mentioned transactional or relational type of buying, um, both both styles, you're going to really need to do some guitar research, right? So where's the best place, in your opinion, where, where people can dive into some guitar research? Man, ask Andy Lund. <laughs> yeah, it's, that's, no, okay. you know, I, I, I like to, in this situation, because a lot of people have come to me because I'm in the business, you know, and, and, and friends and family and total strangers on airplanes, you know, asking me my advice on guitars. And uh, I try to be as impartial as, as possible. I mean, again, we're, we're talking about something that's fun, right? Guitar playing is fun. Making music is fun. And, and let's not forget that ever, ever. But um, I kind of like the wisdom of the crowd. You know, it's, it's good. There's tons and tons of stuff online. You can get lost for days searching online, but that's a good data point, you know, start there. Then talk to friends and family who, you know, are, are guitar players and get their opinions. You know, talk to the guy that leads worship at your church and, and ask him questions about why he uses what he uses and, and, and what he recommends. So, you know, well, use the use the wisdom of the crowd. But then also when, you, when it's time to get that first guitar, you know, my my I, you know, I didn't tell you I actually had a guitar before the guitar I bought. It was a hand me down from my sister and it was it was terrible. It was it was a six string disincentive to play. And uh, it was it was just awful. And and so I would. There's an old saying in our industry, you know, buy nice, not twice. Buy the right guitar first, and not have to you know replace one because it was you know you're cutting your hands on the fret ends and that kind of thing. And that has actually happened. Uh, in fact, to me, I cut my hand on a guitar that I was demoing for somebody because the fret end was sticking out. So that's a terrible experience. So. Uh, you know, take your budget, bring it up a little bit, you know, <laughs> or, or see if you can borrow a guitar uh, to get started when you're to, to really make that decision. But uh, and, and you know what? Do it now. <laughs> There's like planting a tree. You know, the ne next best day to start playing guitar is today. Yeah, that's my story. I got a good one. Buy once, cry once. <laughs> <laughs> nice. <laughs> Great. That's true. Buy once, try once. And so. So if I may interject, because you guys really did hold it together and I appreciate you all so much. In fact, Gabriel was like, you want me to log in and run the show and just be you? And I was like, kind of right now. Um, but advice for folks who are new at buying an in, in instrument, you just touched on that one thing. And we've, we've spoken about it in other episodes, but budget. What, what do you think about when you... What should you think about? You know, you may a mom and pop store may not be able to give you the, you know, super great deal on this thing because that's just not how they operate. But what should you think about with budgeting for your instrument? Man, double it and add 40. Yeah, it's uh, a <laughs> uh, it's you, you know, it we have so many ways to spend disposable income right now. You know, you can get deep into video games or, you know, I've mentioned golf a couple of times and, you know, it's, uh, yeah, I see that comment there. It's fun. Uh, determine that you really want to give it a stab, you know, and, and 
you, you can't just flail at it. You know, it's like you make it. A, it's like, this is going to be a priority for me. And like I tell people again, total stranger, strangers on airplanes. I said, remember when you buy a guitar, promise me you'll play for 15 minutes a day. You know, and I, I say the best time to play is is like right before you go to bed at night because you're kind of tuning everything out. It's a great diversion. And 15, 20 minutes a day over the course of a month, you're going to be amazed when you look back where you came from, you know, and at how your playing has progressed. So, you know, be sure you want to do it. Uh, be ready to spend a wee bit more, you know, and like Andy, you know, you kind of you, you put on layaway, pay that thirty seven dollars off over the next 12 months. And uh, <laughs> And it's uh, it's well worth it. So I, I would always coach someone to spend to stretch their budget a little more because and and there'll be if for whatever reason they decide not to stick with it, perish the thought. Uh, there'll be a little more resale value on it too with with an instrument that isn't disposable, so to speak. So uh, I don't know if that answers the question, Jay, but uh, it does just yeah. invest a little bit more. I know when mm -hmm. I mean, let's go back to my saxophone days. My parents invested. They didn't just buy the cheap guitar or cheap saxophone. They invested. They they got me a really nice saxophone. You've heard me say it before because I had to play this hand-me-down clarinet first, and that was a real <laughs> bummer. Um, that was a real bummer. But um, they invested. And you know what? There was resale value there when I ended my time with the saxophone. But I used to say that when I worked at Sam Ash, you know? Mm, let's find you an instrument that's going to feel really good. And, and, you know, I, I, it was, a, I would say it was about a month after I started working at Taylor. I went back, my, I moved out to San Diego before my family. So I went back to get them and I went back to my old stomping grounds, Buffalo Grove, Sam Ash. And there was a young, younger kid. I want to say he was in his teens and his mom was with him and they were buying an instrument. And I, at this point, had worked at, I'm working at Taylor. I'm drinking the Kool-Aid. And <laughs> of course, mom came there and was like, an acoustic guitar, you play metal. You're really not going to play this. So let's just spend enough, you know? And I, 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 I put a 114 CE in his hand. Mm -hmm. And it was a little bit above their budget. And I got a, an email, for, I gave her, they, purchased it. I gave them my card and she sent me an email about a year and a half later that said, he loves it. And I love you. He doesn't play metal anymore. <laughs> he plays. It's really, it was really funny, but yeah, <laughs> invest, invest buy once. That's, that's great. Yeah. And I, and I've put my money where my mouth is, you know, I spent my entire summer earnings and man, I hate to tell you what minimum wage was back then, but it took a lot of hours of my summer to, to buy that first guitar. And I, I don't regret it whatsoever. It's stuck with me all this time because it was a, it was a good instrument and a good experience. Man, I tell you, thinking about this and all the stuff I've sold in like music gear over the years, I don't know if I could count on one hand the number of people who have said, man, I wish I didn't spend this much money. And now with an instrument. Yeah, yeah. Right? Yep, I, I agree mean, totally, Andy. You, could, you can say, wow, I went to Vegas and I spent a lot of money. Okay, that's that's one thing, right? But when you buy something like a guitar, that if it's good enough, it will outlast you. It becomes an heirloom. You can give it to somebody if you choose in the future. You can sell it later. It doesn't it, that what well, that argument holds no no it it holds no water with me. Wait, it allows water. It that argument doesn't work with me. I think uh, spend as much as you can, get the best thing you can. You'll be happy. Yep. I would agree. We have Absolutely. a couple of really good questions in the feed. Yep. Um, if I may pull them up. Um, this one's good. How to find what local shop is best for getting your guitar set up and or serviced if needed. Good question. Really good question. Yeah, yeah. Start with an instrument you don't care about and see how they do on that. <laughs> I've actually <laughs> I've never heard that advice, but it's now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, it's, it's, yeah, that's a, that's a good, it's a really good question. And there, you know, thankfully Taylor has a, a, a network of authorized service centers that, that, you know, are vetted and, and you can trust them, but just to take uh, a guitar to, to anybody, you know, I, I don't know, are there Yelp reviews for, for such a thing? I, I don't know, but, uh, uh, you know, talking it up to people while you're in the store, 
you know, and say, Hey, have you ever used the, the guy at the bench here? You know, and, and, uh, and then talking directly to that, that repair tech is, is a good indicator too. You know, now if you're brand new and you don't know much, you don't know anything, sometimes you have to just roll the dice. They're, they're going to be in that store for a reason. And if they weren't good, they probably wouldn't be there. They wouldn't, uh, you know, earn the right to, to stay in that, in that spot. But uh, but start small, you know, don't uh, have them repair a, a broken headstock on a, on a Les Paul custom, you know, have them just do a basic setup on a guitar to make it playable for you. And if you like the work, then that's a good indicator that that uh, they, they're, they're good at what they do. That's really good. Here's one that's just pretty, pretty direct. Prime time. Can I trust GC for repairs and routine maintenance? Uh, well, that man, that's a. Really interesting question, and I, I would say yes, you can. Uh, emphatically, you've got a big company that'll back you up if there's a problem, and you know they've got the responsibility of of nearly what 300 locations around the country. That's a huge responsibility to keep all those stores staffed with with really capable uh, repair techs. You know, that's a that's a big job. And uh, again, I would, I would go through the process of, of discovery, talking to them. You know, and uh, if it's their first day on the job and and they've never tuned a guitar before, you know, you want to turn and run. But I don't think that's going to be the case at Guitar Center. So I think an, an ounce of caution, no matter where you go, is is worth it. And uh, asking some basic questions. And of course, you know, this the, the level of work. If you're having a non bolt neck acoustic guitar, uh, you know, having having neck work done, that's a really really big repair. And you want to be able to interview who who it is that that's doing the work for you. That's that's a big job. That's major surgery, right? So it, it depends on the, the severity of the work you're having done. Um, you know, as to the the GC stores, um, man, they they go through a process just like anywhere else to to earn the right to to be at that bench. So yeah. Here's an interesting question. I'm gonna pull it up. This is for everybody What ha that has a collection of guitars. What makes you buy another one? A particular mm -hmm. song, sound, or wanting to learn something new? That's a good question, Kevin. That is. That's a really good question. Anybody? Who wants to take this one? Yeah. Well, from I can say just for me, it's uh, it's a let's see, sound. It's a little bit of a all of it, right? Uh, sometimes it's the sound where I just want a certain guitar because of sound. Sometimes it's just aesthetics. Something looks really pretty and I want it or really, like, really nice. Like, you know, I've bought guitars just for aesthetics sometimes and as long as they have good necks and stuff. But yeah, sound, <laughs> aesthetics and um, yeah, that's usually it. Sound and aesthetics. I'm trying to think. Andy, how about you? I'm curious your answer on this one. By the time you actually can say you have a collection of guitars, uh, you usually know more than you did when you bought your first one, hopefully. <laughs> right. But so for me, I think it's more about your, you've learned what sound you might not have uh, it covered. Um, you know, it's, these are subtle things, right? Um, yes, you can play any gig on any guitar and get through it, right? But there's definitely a difference between a Fender and a Gretsch. Right, and there's a difference between a Gibson um, and a Strat, or a Gibson and a Tele, or something like that. Yep. So, aesthetics definitely come into play, uh, and if you are somebody who really falls in love with a particular guitar, like if you love uh, Grand Auditoriums, or if you love Stratocasters, or if you love Tellys, there's always, as Lindsay mentioned, there's always <laughs> going to be a new model that's going to be like, dang, that thing looks good, and it sounds good too. Um, so yeah. there's that. Uh, but for me, I think it's more about adding to the arsenal um, of, of tools. And, and I, I think that what has also happened to me over the years is that these purchases, these new acquisitions yield new ideas from, from, from me. Like, uh, like it, there's nothing cooler than getting a, a, playing a guitar for the first time and playing something that you've never played before. Uh, how do you put a price on that? Right. That's that's for me, that's a really cool thing. And and I think that sometimes, as was mentioned in that question, sometimes those songs, those licks, those ideas, that emotion is buried inside that thing. And once you connect to it, that's the only way it comes out. Man, that's so good. That's so good. Mm -hmm. That that is. I, I the analogy I use is is 
these the guitars are a color to paint with. You know, imagine you got Bob Ross, right? He's got his palette and he's going to put some snow on the mountain caps. And he says, oh, dang it. I, I don't have any white here to do that with, you know, or <laughs> I don't have, I don't have any blue for the sky. I, I need to go buy some blue, you know? So we, we, uh, this is how I justify additional guitar purchases at the Pelletier residence. And that is, <laughs> Honey, I don't have one that does this exactly, you know. And I need it's there's a there's a gap here, and uh, and 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 can I can I share with you guys the 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 wisdom of of my wife in in how uh, I I can spend money on guitars? Please, it's the, best, it's the most shrewd negotiation ever. <laughs> she said, Just "Get whatever guitars you want. I will never ever stop you from getting the guitars that you want. Just remember, I'm going to spend." just as much on shoes and man i tell you that's brilliant it's it's like it's like <laughs> it's like golden handcuffs it's like oh because any guitar i get it's going to cost me twice as much but no i'm what about, joke, fabric? about does, does she also spend the same amount on fabric also no, like the fabric <laughs> no i you know i don't think either of us been a fabric store in in decades thankfully oh, okay yeah, yeah. <laughs> nothing is fabric stores we all need fabric you know it's important. We all need fabric. See, I, I love see, that. I, I'm, go ahead. Sorry. I said, see, I, I married a musician, so he gets it. So <laughs> I, he, he get, he supports gear. I support his yeah. gear. He supports my gear and we're just good. Do you, <laughs> do you borrow each other's gear often? Is it well, he's, like, no, cause he's a keyboardist. He play with like pedals sometimes, but, yeah. but you know, if he wants to try like, put the big sky through and run a keyboard through that for the MIDI, but, uh, uh -huh. but no, no, but he supports a hundred percent me buying guitars for whatever right reason. For yeah. this. Man, you got it. <laughs> hey. I'm a, I'm a, you're a palette uh, colors on your palette guy. I'm a arrows in my quiver. Uh -huh. guy. Um, <laughs> I, I tour, I t guitar tech some very, some wonderful guitar players all over the world. And, you know, you, you, you got your, your folks who Eddie Breckenridge, he's in a band called thrice. He plays three basses and they're all the same, or you get bands, you know, I did a short, short, short stint with, uh, you know, Mushuga and they've got all the guitars or like Lincoln park where you got a guy that keeps buying the same PR, you know, he's got a PRS thing. And I heard him say once out loud, I want a guitar with a different tone. So, you know, the conversation went like, Whoa, well, what are you looking for? Well, something like a strat. Well, get a strat. <laughs> he's like, nah. <laughs> so, I mean, there's those, those, those people, but I, I'm a firm believer in get the guitar that does the thing. It's, it's fun. It makes it all really fun. Um, let's see if we have any more questions and we can move the show along. Uh, Lindsay, I got the report back that you did the best just jumping in and taking over. So I think <laughs> that was Andy and I, we tag team. You guys were awesome. Andy are just going to, I can take a vacation. <laughs> no, you can't. <laughs> you can. No. You could. Come on, Andy, be confident. We can do this. <laughs> Jay, for the record, I felt I was in very capable hands while you were on your hiatus there. Well, there are, these, these two were awesome. Do you understand who I – let's hide. Close your eyes. You're must. Do you <laughs> understand who I get to do the show with, Dave, on a weekly basis? I mean, it's uh, – the talent, it's incredible. We don't really have that many more questions. We had one that was pretty great, but I may have lost it. Maybe I can find it. Here we go. Where'd you go in the feed? Nope. I think I lost the question. You know why you're looking for it? Another. I just thought of another reason why I have why someone would get another, a couple guitars, different tunings, different setups, different things yeah. like that. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Absolutely. That's more than a worthy reason to tell your significant other. <laughs> and in our world too. <laughs> You know, shapes is, is a real thing, you know, yes, again, yeah. I, I said, the more you, the longer you play, the more you learn about stuff. And I, I went on about electric guitars, but shapes it's and for in the acoustic world. That's a, you know, that's a real thing. Like the, the GT, yep. 
Totally. Like that guitar is super cool and it's so easy to play and so fun, you know. It's challenge totally. working at Taylor with all these things that we come out with, you know. Oh, sorry, Jay, go ahead. I found it. Hey, Mr. Dave, what's your favorite guitar shape, acoustic guitar shape? Oh, man, it, it's wow. That's a brutally tough. It's like, which of your kids do you love the most? You know, it's there's there's no way to answer that question. Uh, I, you know, I've, I've got this Grand Pacific behind behind me. I'm reversed here. Uh, I've fallen in love with it. And, uh, and and it's all the attributes of that guitar, the, the B class bracing and, and the, the neck shape. It, it's I'd have to say it's my favorite right now, but the Grand Auditorium, it, ah, man, this is tough. It's impossible. It's I, see, I need all these things, right? Andy mentioned the GT. Uh, that's an amazing shape. It does something oh, that the yeah. other guitars don't do. And so you, you go through these seasons where you kind of fall in love with a certain shape or a tone wood combination. And that's why I'm saying it's so tough to work at Taylor because we're, we're bombarded with all these amazing things all the time and they all do something slightly different, you know? And, and you start justifying why you need them in your quiver or on your palette or in your, your toolkit. So that's a tough one. It's uh, right now I'm really digging the, the Grand Pacific, the 517E that's behind me. It's been my pandemic buddy and uh, <laughs> a lot of, a lot of hours on it. And, uh, but you know what, this, that season will blend into the next one and uh, I'm sure it'll be something else. I haven't spent a ton of time yet with our grand symphonies with the sound port cutaway. That's that's kind of the next one I want to dig into, and and I know there's going to be some good stuff waiting for me when I when I dig into it. Uh, I was asked today because somebody wanted an instrument for writing guitar scores, and of course we at Taylor, it's kind of baked in sometimes to say, well, an A14C, it's just a great around, you know, all around guitar. But then we have so many grand auditoriums that are great. 514CE. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Uh, I mean, cedar and mm -hmm. mahogany, all mahogany. Yep. Yep. Uh, you know, 524, the 324, the builder's edition 324 with ash, urban ash on the back of it. But I would have to say that for writing atmospheric scores, the 816 is my, that's a guitar that if I could lean into just a little bit more. And mm -hmm. I understand we all went through the same thing. When we first saw it, we all kind of went, what is this thing? <laughs> what is Mr. Powers doing now? Um, but if you have your chance to put one of those in your hands and just play it, it will, it will blow your mind. Um, we're working with a band called Manchester Orchestra, and I've shared a video internally. Yep. Oh, yeah. Oof. Um, yeah. That's the guitar that Andy Hall plays, and it's, it's just it's beautiful. 816, that would be my guitar. That, I think that's the next one I want to dive into. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Oh, boy, I got to buy another guitar. This is going to be crazy. I know. I know. It's where this is going, isn't it? <laughs> totally going there. Um, all right. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you guys for holding down the fort for me when I fell off and my someone ran over the Internet here over yeah, in my thanks. neighborhood. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, my Internet service provider, they let me know that everything is going to be OK in a matter of five minutes. So we're good to go. We're back. We're live. <laughs> Dave, thank you so much for your inspiration and your time with us. I think it's time to move this show along. Hmm. Hmm. The next segment is called Lindsay's Question. <laughs> Here we go. <laughs> Andy Lund, <laughs> do you have a song? Hey, Dave. If she stumps you, it's okay. <laughs> she has a history, has a way. No one knows what's on her mind. 
The question is by design to get to know you. Hey, Dave. To get to know you. Uh, wow, there's there's Hey Jude, there's Hey Joe, and and now Hey Dave. I, hey, it's, Dave. It's, hey Dave. I love the abrupt the abrupt stop. Get to know you. Get to know you. Yeah. <laughs> just get falls to off. know you. He's getting a little breathy too. It's so good. Yes, yeah. very breathy. Love it. Love very, it. very John Mayer. Hey, hit Dave <laughs> old <with> old John <laughs> Mayer. <laughs> what? Okay. Oh, you know what? I'm I'm gonna keep it simple because. Dave, you were sweating. Uh, come, on. <laughs> come on, toss uh, me a softball, Lindsay. Yeah, here, here's, a, here's a softball. <laughs> what? What is a? I'm gonna go to a, our favorite. What is a hidden, or Jay likes me to say, useless talent that you have that maybe nobody knows that you could share with us all today? <laughs> <laughs> oh man, most of them apparently. Um, wow. Oof. Gosh. Uh, yeah, yeah. What you're going to learn about me is that I, I draw a blank quickly. Yeah. That's, that's the memorable <laughs> thing about me is that I, uh, useless talent, man. Um, wow. I, I don't know. I don't have many. I try to use the ones I have and, uh, you them? <laughs> man, you may have, wow. I told you <laughs> this was the part I was intimidated the most about being on the show was the question you're going to ask me. And <laughs> Man, useless time. I mean, I'm sure I've got friends and family who are shouting things at the screen right now, like all right. kinds of things that that they see me doing that are like, useless. Can you, do, and can you do a handstand? Like, what's going I mean, on? No, no, no. Okay, okay. Here's here's one. All right, I have a uh, I ride a skateboard. All right, and I and I bought a, a cool brand. Uh, I don't know if I can mention the brand on the air. All right, so I always wanted to say that it's okay. it's a carver, and it's meant it's meant for surfers who who is, it has trucks on it that you can propel the board without actually having to push it. So by rocking the board back and forth, you can propel yourself forward. And I can go forever on flat surface with that skateboard. <laughs> there you go. Forever. I can propel myself forever. Wow! Without putting my feet, without touching the ground, on that board. How's that? <clears throat> That's great. I mean, it, there's no better time. There's absolutely no better time than to segue to. <laughs> right? Whoa. Check this out. Two minutes of sports. Andy. I love how out of tune that guitar is on that little useless clip, Jay. It's all <laughs> so good, right? Useless clips. Andy, do you, do you have a tune? Two minutes of sports on the road to the final four. The month of March means so much madness, complete joy and other sadness. Bracket buster, hustle muster, where to begin, lame show Big Ten. On two minutes of sports. <laughs> I was going to talk to you about skateboarding, but I'm glad you brought that up. So we don't have to talk about skateboarding. I as well skateboard on a regular basis and Dave yep. and I know this about each other and that's, that's fantastic. So let's go right into the, uh, baseball conversation. Huh? Why don't we Dave Padres? You're wearing a Padres hat. Why are you wearing a Padres hat when I've seen you root for the Dodgers sometimes? What's up with that? Well, you know, I was born in San Diego, right? So, so wherever you're born, you have a contractual obligation, a moral obligation to root for that team, no matter what, right? You, you can't, you can't sidestep your home team and root for, you know, some perennial winner, right? So I am, I am obligated to root for the Padres no matter what. However, having lived in LA and having great memories uh, of the Dodgers victory in uh, World Series victory in 1988. Uh, I, I remember that game, that game one, Kirk Gibson against Dennis Eckersley, the most dramatic sports moment in my life that I've ever watched real time. 
uh, it was a fun year. My, my wife and I, we weren't married yet. Um, we were, we'd go to Dodger games because we were living in LA for five bucks. You could sit out in the bleachers, get a Dodger dog, which were famous. And it was a cheap date. And we caught a few games that year and, and the Padres were mathematically eliminated. So I could transfer my allegiance from the Padres to the Dodgers. And, and it may have happened like the first month of the season when, you know, that the pods were eliminated. So anyway, uh, once they are, that's, that's the rule for me. Once the pods are out of it, I transfer my allegiance to the Dodgers. I'll root for them. Uh, but when the Dodgers are in town here, oh, no, no, it's go pods all the way. So I know it's strange to keep it all within the NL West, but, uh, but that's, that's how I roll. It's totally fine. If you do recall, Kirk Gibson was a tiger. Oh, yeah. And we had my family, a cousin of mine had uh, season tickets at Tiger Stadium, not the new ballpark, but at Tiger Stadium. And he had left field seats. And that was one of the greatest moments was going as a kid to Tiger Stadium and Kirk Gibson just walking over and doing the like lean and just hanging out with the kids on the side. Like Kirk Gibson. But if you do remember, he hit the same walk off for the Tigers doing the same thing. But when he did it in Dodger Blue, it was, oh, what a bummer. <laughs> what a bummer. Right. That's right. Check this out. Kirk Gibson won in 1984. You are right. Against the Padres. Yeah. And then Gabriel has to bring this up. I get you, my friend. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yeah. The Tigers did beat the Padres in 84, but we're hometown right now. So I, right. I don't have my Tigers wow. to hang out with. All right. So we're going right into trivia. Um, last week, we are dialing in. We got your winners. The winners reached out to us. We are going to connect you with Carrie Too Smooth to yeah. get your each of you get a one hour free lesson. So I thought that was such a cool prize that I wanted to do it again. Yeah. But this week, it's with Nicholas Vinaglu. As you know, Nick was on the show a few episodes back. That was before the holiday break, I believe. Yep. Um, and so I called him right away and I was like, hey, we did this last week. Will you do it this week? And he was super pumped on that. So we're giving away two prizes, two one-hour free lessons with these guys. I want to say this on the air. We didn't want them to just give us free time. So we're actually purchasing them from the, these, this is how they make a living. So I, I, I really wanted to make that clear that yeah. we are buying these for you because what a gift. Mm -hmm. How cool is that? So later in the season, I'm going to try to give away one full year subscription to Carrie's camp. So Carrie too smooth, who was on last year or last uh, episode, Last week, we're going to give away one entire year of lessons for Carrie's camp. Stay tuned. It's going to be in a few weeks from now. All right. You guys ready for these questions? You know the deal. You know the rules. The rules are Gabriel and Paul Tobias cannot answer the questions. Those are the rules. If you win, if you win and you are in the first in the feed, and sometimes you guys understand that the YouTube feed hits a little bit sooner, so... We'll work it out if, if, if we miss. Mm -hmm. All right. But if you win, email us at primetime at taylorguitars.com. We'll connect you with Nick and you will get your lessons. Cool. All right. First question is, this one might take some research because I don't know if we even said it, but you guys have the Google. You can research. <laughs> first comes first. Gabriel, check us and make sure we have the winner correct. The first question is, what year was the first Guitar Center opened? Ooh. What year, in what year was the first Guitar Center opened? Andy, do you have a tune? <laughs> <laughs> Ooh. This is a good one. Whoa! Gabriel. I see the right answer. Check me. Was he right? Do you see it? Who's first on your list? Is it uh, Timothy? 
Oh, Gabriel's asking. <laughs> oh my goodness, Gabriel! You know the answer. We said it. <laughs> he doesn't know the answer. <laughs> Hold on, I'm going back. <laughs> I want to say. It looks like it was on my list. It looks like it was uh, a boo. Really? Yeah. Uh, if you go to the the and uh, scroll all the way up. Did we stump them? Nope. Nope. The answer is in the private chat. Yeah, go to the, the comments and scroll all the way up. Yep. 724. It looks like it's a boo. I'm pretty sure. No, look at the feed again. Look at look at the comments again. Wrong year. Gabriel. Timothy. Timothy, Timothy, <laughs> that took way longer. Oh. Than it. <laughs> oh. The answer is 1959. 1959, and it was an organ shop before it was a guitar center or a guitar shop. Ah, yes. there we go. Yes. 1959. That's so awesome. That, what a tough question that was. <laughs> what a what are the toughest questions we've ever asked? <laughs> <laughs> uh, Clearly. Timothy. Hit us up at primetime at taylorguitars.com and we'll hook you up. You know the deal. You've won before. Good job. All right. The next question. Here we go. And the again, the rules apply. <laughs> Tobias, you can't answer the question. Okay? Yes. I hope we got this answer right, too. But Dave, <laughs> we've been known to have the wrong answers. It's fine. It's fine. <laughs> we love doing this. All right. Here we go. Next question. Uh... Let's what see. was Tobias Music shop before it was a guitar shop? What was the space? What was the building? Paul, you can't answer, and it's not 1974. <laughs> can't do it. <laughs> yes, Timothy Sue is the answer. For it. He won the last question. <laughs> yeah. Rob. This was mentioned. Yeah. Rob, no, Abu, wait, they're all flying in. Who said it? No. Was it John? Did oh, Gabe, Gabe put it in the private? All right. Sorry, brain froze. Speedy, <laughs> speedy, too speedy for you, 22. That's what Gabriel said. The answer is barbershop. Yeah, that looks right. He's right. Where is it? Ah, oh, there uh, it is. Yep, yep. Right after Jag. Too speedy for you, 22. Right after Jag Productions. Good job. I don't know your name, but too speedy, you were speedy. Good work. <laughs> that was awesome. Paying attention. Paying attention. <laughs> All greatest, right. The greatest trivia. The greatest trivia ever. <laughs> ever. <laughs> the answers. <laughs> awesome, awesome, awesome. Thank you all for hanging out with us. Dave, Dave, Dave Pelletier. Man, you are you are a shining light at Taylor Guitars, and we appreciate you a ton. And oh, hey, Lindsay, guys, I Lindsay, got you. Lindsay and Andy, you guys, like, I love this the job security, this, 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 <laughs> this thing right like i could go on a vacation or spend <laughs> next tuesday night skateboarding with dave and you guys can handle it yeah buddy really good to know anyway mm -hmm. thank you so much <laughs> for hanging out with us thank you guys sorry about my technical difficulties that's how it happens sometimes good recovery buddy andy you want to take it away <laughs> What was it? What was it? It was prime time. It was prime time. What the heck was it? What was that? Well, well, that was prime time. Well, that was another prime time. Thanks to Mr. Pelletier. Dave says to know what you're looking for and invest a little more. <laughs> Dave says, find an expert. Where would you sign your friend? 
Shop where you will be best served. It's a better deal in the end. Good advice on prime time <laughs> on a Tuesday. We're okay without Jay. <laughs> we know on prime time. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> See you next week. Thanks a lot, Dave. I'm honored, guys. Thank you so much. See you next week, guys. You're amazing.